Guys, welcome back to another episode on the Dynamic Lifestyle Podcast. We have an awesome, awesome guest with us today, the one and only Tiffany Tyler. How are you doing today? So great. Uh, I don't know if you guys have heard um, that phrase, uh, blessed and highly favored. Have you heard that before? No, no. no. Or they say it a lot in church, but I'm feeling blessed and highly caffeinated. I'm just going to like put a spin on it a little bit, <laughs> but that's yeah. how I'm feeling today. <laughs> I like that. I like that. So you, you, So what kind of coffee do you drink? I'm on the Bulletproof. Um, oh, okay. Lewis Howe's got me on that. Uh, we partnered with them for Summit of Greatness. And mm-hmm. at first I was like, this is so weird. And now I can't drink anything else. No cream, no sugar, <laughs> um, Bulletproof all the way. For sure. Right on. No, I mean, we're huge coffee junkies ourselves. So my whole thing is I got I to gotta just like be careful of having too much towards the end of the afternoon, evening, because then I can't get to sleep. I am the exact same way. I have, I'm <laughs> limiting myself to one cup a day. Uh-huh. Oh, yeah, that's hard. Rough. <laughs> it is rough. And I've just been trying to convince myself that the water is so good. The water is just as good. It's going to be fine. Drink more yeah. water. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, Tiffany, no, uh, thanks so much for uh, you know taking time out of your day. I know you're busy. You got a lot going on. I'm excited about just everything we're going to be talking about today because you're doing so much. you know. And I know we've known each other for, I want to say, over three years. We connected back at, um, it was the MITT uh, program in LA. Mm-hmm. So yeah, we got a lot of stuff to, to talk about. So let's, let's dig into this. We're going to always start off with rapid dynamic questions. You ready for that? Ready. Okay. Ready. So you live in LA as well, and you know that there's tons of billboards all around. So what if the mayor just granted you a, a billboard and said, Tiffany, you can put any message on there. So what would that be? You are enough. You are enough. Okay. Powerful. Okay. What's the biggest lesson you've learned during this past like six months during this pandemic? Ooh, that if it's to be, it's up to me. MITT is rolling it back to that. Um, that that's the biggest one. If if I'm going to be mentally well, uh, healthy in all areas of my life, it's up to me to do it, and no one else. Okay, so pretty like much that. betting on yourself. Mm-hmm. Like that, love that. Finish the sentence. The world needs more of hugs when we when it's safe. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I know it's probably not correct because it's more of, but uh, I just think that more love, maybe more of the love that we share with each other. Maybe that's what the world needs more of. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So kind of just like going into 2020 and then like we have three months pretty much left in this year. What are maybe like two skills you think that an entrepreneur just like pretty much has to kind of like nail down or think about like really acquiring? Self-awareness is key um, because you're just doubling down on your strengths and your weaknesses. And I say doubling down on weaknesses because if you know what you're not good at, you can delegate twice as well, twice as much, um, which is great. And the second thing would be learning your market. The market is changing. Uh, If things are moving to online, if your business was really hit because you're used to being in person and doing events, then how can you do both moving into 2021? Because things are changing, but not as quickly as most people are hoping. Right. Yeah. Yeah. What is a uh, two books every entrepreneur should read? And you could even go with audio books, but you might not. I, I don't know if you like to just do the <laughs> physical books or audio, but e- either or. I'm a mix. I'm a mix. The Alchemist, definitely. Okay. And um, The Art of Nonconformity, Chris Gillibo. Those are my mm. two. I've mm. never read the second one, so definitely have to look that one up. It's, it's, it's amazing. It's yeah, you'll love it. The beginning just will get you right off the bat. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay. So I, I feel focus is a huge skill and I feel like it's underrated. It's not very sexy and talked about enough. What's your number one like, tip to stay focused? That's a good question. Number one tip to stay focused. This is actually a struggle for me um, would be to come up with a good routine. It doesn't have to be your entire day, but if you have a, a solid morning or night routine, then you can stay consistent. And I think that helps, it helps me with my focus. Um, so that would be my, my, it doesn't have to be both, but at least one routine that keeps you on point, keeps you consistent. I think that will help you focus throughout the rest of the day. Okay. What keeps you up at night? <sighs> All the ideas in my head. Um, <laughs> I, I, I'm usually am able to sleep really well because I run really early in the morning. But lately, since I've reduced a lot of my hours across all my contracts to take some time and breathe, um, I, all the ideas that were kind of like pushed down have been coming back up. So that's what's keeping me up right now. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Tiff. So one more question and you are off the hot seat. So what's something that's just maybe unique or something, you know, surprising the world doesn't know about Tiff Tyler? Um. 
that I played drums for most of my childhood. I don't think oh. I've talked about that yet. Yeah, my family okay. was very musical. I didn't sing, everyone else did, but the drums were my thing. Nice. Yeah. I used to play the tr- the drums too, like around, I think like fifth or sixth grade, but I wasn't that talented and uh, it was still fun though. I liked it though. Yeah, he, th- he thought he was fun. cool. He thought he was cool <laughs> rocking out with his drumsticks. <laughs> just, twir- just twirling them, right? Like you can't even keep a beat, but you're just like, yeah, yeah. I can spin these sticks though. Absolutely. It, exactly. <laughs> exactly. All right, let's shift gears here. So you're a video producer, media creator, and entrepreneur. Where does all this drive come from and what was your upbringing like? Did your parents always say like, tiff like you know stick to the 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 status quo nine to five go to school get a good job all that stuff kind of play it safe i love my parents because they put zero pressure on us um truthfully if we all lived in the house and cleaned up after ourselves my parents would be happy they Mm. they are like stay here we'll keep each other safe and protect each other don't go out into the world we love you stay (laughs) so (laughs) moving across the country was tough for all of us because we are a very um close family like i mentioned the drums in our as best as I could be rapid fire, I did my best. Um, But uh, we traveled, um, we were like, not a Jackson 5, but we were a family band that would travel from church to church. And we were, we would play music together and songs. My mom's a minister now. And um, we just, that was just what bonded us. And I feel like I've had such a solid foundation on understanding how to be a light in the world, how to live by example, how not to judge people. I think some people think of church and they think of judgment and I understand because I've seen it, you know, but I think the way our mom protected us and made sure we were, we understood right from wrong in that sense. Um, I really felt like coming out here to LA, I, even though things were hard, they were painful. Um, just cause I came out here with zero contacts. Like, let's just see what happens. Um, I had a very solid foundation of understanding um, just to live by example and to not judge people and to love everyone, no matter what they do to me or say to me, it would, that was the foundation that I had. And we were also, like I said, we traveled with to church to church, but my dad was also just very nomadic. We moved from, I, I went to three different uh, middle schools in three different states. So I'm used to moving. I'm used mm. to meeting, a, a, being in different groups of people and I'm not used to talking a lot. College is where I got to learn how to talk. But uh, for the most part, just always on the move, always on the go. I think I got that mentality from that kind of upbringing. Gotcha. And and what made you guys move or like, what made you move to LA? I moved to LA because it was always the dream. I had a camera. I'm saying somewhere between seven and 12. I always thought it was seven, but I look at my niece right now. She's eight. And I'm like, there's no way they gave me that hundreds of dollars worth of equipment. <laughs> like, when I, I don't know. <laughs> I think it was somewhere between seven and 12. And um, it's always been my thing. And my first time I got paid for it, I was in high school uh, cutting the girls basketball reels. And I was mm. just, oh, I could do this. And like I said, my parents had no limits. They didn't they didn't say you have to go to college. You don't have to go to college. Like there was, I chose to go to college because I just had a feeling that I just knew I wasn't social enough. I barely talked in high school. I couldn't really, I couldn't be in a group of people and not be super uncomfortable. So college allowed me to break out of my shell a little bit and um, major in film and multimedia. And LA, LA was just always the dream. I forgot it sometimes along the way, you know, as we just are in it. I paid for, I paid my way through college. So I left with zero debt. So I just worked really hard for four years, kept my GPA up, made sure I had my scholarships and my grants. So I lost the dream a little bit, but then it was reinvigorated and been on here for seven years. Still don't know when I look back how I was able to hit all these really cool goals, but um, moving and trying new things is just kind of instilled in me. Yeah. And that's crazy. Cause I can totally relate. You know, we've been out in LA for like seven years too. And I mean, you know, it, it's like a dream for some reason to come out there and we, that's, it was one of our dreams too, one, a huge goal, but you get so caught up in like the day to day grind and the hustle. And it's so fast out here to where it's like time flies and you do forget like, man, like what was the reason I came out here? What was the big goal? Because there's so much opportunity. Right. So you mentioned right. there was like, there's a, there was pains, there's struggles that you went through from moving, you know, like what were some of those pains and struggles? How'd you overcome them? Well, I mean, just being for the first time across the country from my family, they're all on the East Coast. Like I said, we're very, very close. And so um, even though I went to college and I lived on campus all four years, I was always 30 minutes away. So I would always be home every Sunday. We still have church in the house. Like we would still be there, right? And so now now my dad's not there to look at the car if I was going to buy it. Now my mom's not there to help me pick out an apartment. You know, there's mm-hmm. just 
actually growing up, I think was the heart was hard at first was like, who am I when I'm not my mother's daughter, when I'm not my father's daughter, my, you know, a sister to my brothers. And that was a little bit painful, but good too. Like I still have my mom's voice in the back of my head, but I can make my own decisions. I can make, I can do a lot of those things. And like I said, I moved out here with no contacts. So it was a grind. I had about three months worth of savings, just kind of ready to go in case um, something were to happen. But I moved in with my cousin, we split the rent. Uh, she let me when I first came here pay about forty percent, not fifty, about forty percent of the rent because she knew, you know, it was it was just coming straight from my pocket. And then, you know, I was just I was doing a lot of free events. People were paying me fifty dollars for working a twelve hour day. I was just saying mm. yes to everything, um, and I didn't feel too bad at that time. But it was like that rent is coming up. What do I do? Yeah. And I did a lot of volunteer work with the Sparks, kind of like almost a semi internship, and then the fourth month when I ran out of money, <laughs> couldn't pay the for the for rent for the fourth month. But um, I was I signed my contract with the WNBA Sparks. Uh, you know, it's, it's a long story. I'm kind of trying to shorten down, but it was just a lot of hustle trying to meet people trying to do as much as I can, like I said, a lot of free work. And then when they realize the season's coming up, and we can use you for the season to really take the pictures, do some of the videos and the campaigns. I signed my first LA contract at 23 years old, 24 years old, 23, 23 years old. Yeah. Yeah. So this is, see, this is a great uh, teaching point because I, I wanted to segue into this, like uh, how you got into like all these amazing opportunities that you did now. And it's again, the listeners, it's seven years. It's a seven year stretch. That's a lot of time. But at the same time, it's like you never sat there and just like, you know, twiddled your thumbs. You always took action. As soon as you got to LA, you're like, how do I sit there and start adding value to people? You know, not overcharge, you know, but just over deliver and look how it's paid off for you. I mean, you've worked with the LA Sparks, Lewis Howes now, Johnny Simmons, Koya Webb. I mean, those are all very big name people. So like, what else do you feel like that you did to kind of just like really get your foot in that door and really prove it to people that you could do this? I mean, I heard someone else say this. I wish I could remember where I heard it, but hunger is a real motivator. I mean, mm -hmm. actual physical hunger. There were days that like, I, I was like, okay, I have 15 bucks left. Either I can go Uber to this gig or I can eat today. I mean, truthfully, you know, so the hustle came from, yes, just wanting to do good things, provide value. And also from, I really didn't have enough money to, you know, think about it too much or to sit and twiddle my thumbs. Like you said, like there wasn't time for that. Um, it, it, I just needed to grind. And what I think, I think my key to um, my success so far is that I, I just listen really well to people and I appreciate everyone who's willing to give me advice. Yeah. Uh, being so green, I ask probably too many personal questions to people like, how much do, did you get paid for this? Uh, what would you do here? You know, I just, from a very kind, loving place, right? Not a competitive or trying to, or anything was just, I'm just so curious. And I think people could see that it was just new curiosity in LA. And so then when these contracts started coming around negotiating, Johnny Simmons, ASC, Emmy Award winning cinematographer, he was helping me when I was pricing myself. Um, and then when I left the, the LA Sparks and went on to Lewis, Christine Simmons, who's now the COO of the um, Academy Awards, right? Uh, she gave me advice on what I should charge him. And so everyone has just been so nice. And I think just asking questions and coming from a place of curiosity can help you, yeah. you know, instead of thinking that you're going to be pushing someone's buttons or anything. And, and I always give them credit. Like on my website, they're listed. And every yeah, time I talk, I, I always, yeah, I want to make sure that the people who have mentored me, who have been in my life that have helped me even with just picking up the phone when I was having a hard time, I want to make sure they get credit because I could not have done any of this by myself. Yeah, no, I love that. And man, kudos to you. I mean, that's amazing, amazing work and just uh, the grind, the grit, everything. So was there ever a point, Tiffany, like where you just felt like, what if I fail? You know, like, I mean, this is getting really too hard, overwhelming. And you're like, maybe I just need to just go back home. Uh, yes. <laughs> um, there was a point where, uh, it was actually right after my 26th birthday. Uh, it was, it, it's hard to even describe the feelings that I felt, but I had a lot, a lot of contracts in different situations had changed right after my birthday. And it felt like, all this really quick success signing almost two to three big contracts in the first two years out here, you know, seemed like it was okay. Maybe that was just dumb luck. And maybe I'm really not talented at this. And really, maybe this just isn't it for me. And I've had plenty of conversations calling my mom and dad and, 
you know, they, like I told you, they're like, oh, come home. Not because they want me to give up on my dream, but they're like, right. we're here, we'll protect you, you know? And I had to sort of be like, what am I going to do when I get back home? Like, once you're out here, you see, I mean, they have palm trees in Florida, but you, uh, you know, you're <laughs> out here and you see the Hollywood sign. I run by the, I, I can see the Hollywood sign every morning on my run. You know, like, it's just so hard to, to not at least have hope, even when you feel like everything is down. And I really thought I was going to move. I really thought I didn't have it. And I think the only thing that helped me, like I said, was my, my, the people around me, my cousin, Danita, who she has like a, a decade in sports and just, she worked for the WNBA as well. And she's right now the president and CEO of the LA Sparks, which is great. She wasn't when we first moved here. Um, but just, just people building me up and letting me know that I can and, allowing that to actually sink in because I think there are people who are supported but it's hard for us to believe in ourselves too even when everyone says you got it you're talented yep. you're okay mm -hmm. um and but I, but it allowed me also to see losing losing some of the money losing some of the hours some of the things that happened during that time it allowed me to see how strong I could be and how great I am at relationships. It allowed me to go, okay, now I get to go back to what worked in the beginning, the free work, the relationships, talking to people, how can I help you? Um, and then actually understanding now I have a portfolio so I can charge a good amount <laughs> yeah. when I go out and do these things. And so I think the ebbs and flows and the pain is unavoidable. Every journey I've heard from people who moved out here, it's, you know, either their family doesn't support them and disown them or, you know, it's just, it is painful, but, Feeling alone and lonely in the pain, I think, is way worse <laughs> than yeah, anything yeah. else. Yeah. Yeah. It, just, it just sounds like all that pain you went through, just all it did was create growth. And I always tell people too, every single day, you know, like tomorrow's not promise, but mm -hmm. every single day is a new day for hope. It truly is. I, I believe so. And that's why I, why I go back to the routine. You know, I think I, as a creative and if there's other creatives listening, we can be emotional. I mean, I will not lie and say that my feelings or sometimes even the work that I did wasn't driven by my emotions. But having picked up this this running routine, I feel like I mean, I know my chemicals are being balanced in my brain, right? I know that uh, now, you know, there's just a, a win for me in the beginning beginning of the day. And so if today I make zero money, you know, I still had a win for today, right? If If today somebody calls me and says, you're the most wonderful person in the world. I'm so glad to know you. Awesome. That's, that makes me feel great. But I already filled my cup today too, right? So I'm not dependent on it necessarily, but I'm just open to whatever's going to happen. I can keep my emotions steady a little bit better. Yeah. And it allows me to make clear decisions, like you said, focus, right? And just be able to come from a place of um, seeing, be, being able to be dynamic and like being able to see 10 years in the future and also be present with what I'm creating right now, right? Just yeah. all that focus focus to me is so important. Yeah. Love that. It's amazing. All right. So if I want to kind of shift gears here and kind of talk about yeah. just some of the stuff you've learned from just being pretty much like exposed to just, you know, all these awesome people that Lewis has had on his podcast and you being right there, like literally in the room during these interviews, you know, so what would you say? I mean, are some of just like some of the biggest like takeaways you've gotten, you know, just by being in the room, just like soaking it up in the sponge? Yeah, uh, you said the sponge. I use that a lot. <laughs> I soak up so much. Uh, at first, I didn't understand why people were so admired that so much when they would say, oh, what's it like to be in the room? What's it like to be in the room? I didn't get it because everyone can hear the podcast. It's free, right? So I didn't quite understand why it was so special that I was in the room until I realized oh, I can remember what they said, right? I am there. I see their body language. I have to now go and edit it for, you know, for another eight hours. So I'm rewatching it. So it's not just that I'm hearing it while I'm doing the dishes or while I'm driving my car like other people are. I am absorbing it and it's sticking, right? And it doesn't mean that it necessarily all the good habits that I learned from all these entrepreneurs kicked in immediately. But the fact that it was there and ready, those tools were there. I think that was amazing. I think, you know, there's so what I loved about the job, what I still love about the job is it's always the podcast I need to hear today. Like there's mm -hmm. always some lesson from somebody mm -hmm. that I'm like, Oh yes, Tiff, that's what you need to do. That's what you need to fix in your relationships and your vision and whatever. Um, but the one that really sticks out to me as I'm talking to you right now is Leslie Odom Jr. From Hamilton. Okay. He 
he had an amazing an amazing story where he talked about uh being in la his very first job was rent he got a big gig right off the bat very similar to me right he got a very big contract but then he was out here for about six years and nothing else really happened after that it was just kind of small gigs here and there and he thought he was going to go apply to be a hotel manager he's like this is it like i have Nothing is happening here. And his agent calls him, his manager calls him, and he says, you can do that. You can go get a regular job. You can move forward. But I would really love for you to try first. And I just love the way he explains the story because he's like, what do you mean? It's been six years. I've been hustling. I've been grinding. Nothing's been happening. What do you mean try first? And his, his manager said, when you get called for a gig, you show up and you show out. You're there 110%. You're prepared. But the phone didn't ring today. What did you do? Did you go to acting classes? Were you preparing? Were you making calls? What were you doing when no one was calling you to get that phone to ring? And that hit me. I, I just get chills thinking about it because it's 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 everything to me. And I think to a lot of artists who are really good at showing up, but not good at doing the work when you're at home and um, all the preparation. And that's why I share my agenda on my Instagram, because most of what I do is not shooting. Most of what I do isn't in that room, even though that's the, the nice part why people like love to follow me but 80 percent of it i am at home answering emails making phone calls like doing the things that are going to open up opportunities mm -hmm. for me down the road and so you know i've learned so much from from everyone but that interview in particular i still remind myself of that especially in pandemic time i'm not in the room right yeah. i am barely in the room so what am i doing when the phone doesn't ring right. how wow. do i create the opportunities Man, that, that is such a powerful like learning lesson. Um, I highly recommend you guys go back and you know timestamp that <laughs> right there because that's a huge, huge lesson. Because everybody kind of just thinks that you know once that phone rings, that's what it's all about. But man, like you have to put in the reps and sets like behind the scenes, you know, that right. people just do not know about and just be ready and prepared. You know, so that's such an awesome learning lesson. And I mean, would you say like just like from all these like just being in the room and just kind of like learning through mm -hmm. osmosis and stuff, like would you say that like just things and lessons have just been like downloading left and right just like out of nowhere or do you think that you just kind of absorb it right then and there and, and grasp like the the lessons from it that's a good question I, I it really depends on what we're talking about whenever we have the therapist on i mean it's right there in the moment i'm like mm -hmm. oh wow tiff there you go you know <laughs> like it just it's right there right then and it's like i almost have a hard time focusing on my job because i'm so into the conversation <laughs> Uh, and like, oh my gosh, I need therapy. But, uh, you know, then we might have an athlete on and that's really, not that I'm not an athlete, but that's more so Lewis's, you know, some, some, some of the way he thinks he might relate more and I'll find the bits and pieces that make sense to me, but it just may not hit me right now. But then maybe a year down the road, truthfully, this has happened because it's been four and a half years. I'll think about that interview like, oh, now I remember why he said that. So I think the people that I relate to immediately, like the artists, the filmmakers that we've had on, their their lessons hit me immediately. But mm -hmm. sometimes people who I don't necessarily connect with in the room will then later down the road pop up in my mind and I'll remember a tool that I can use now if I'm running into a sticky situation. Gotcha. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's a good point. That's interesting. And then um, I, I, on your website, you said stories move the world. So what is the story that you want to leave when it's all said and, and done? Ooh, I love that. And Kobe, like when Kobe said that quote on my side, I was just like, oh, I was there. I filmed it. I, yeah, anyway, yeah. it's just like it's, it's one of those really powerful ones. The story, I, I think it's hard because I, I don't think there's one story, but I do think the purpose behind the stories that I want to tell it's always about connecting us as humans. I think if someone in India can watch somebody in Kansas and be like, wow, I can relate to their story, even though we didn't grow up in the same culture or in the same area, I, I, want, I really want to make stories that around the world, right? Not just in America, not just people who I might relate to because the way I grew up can, can connect and understand that we are all humans and that maybe we can give each other a little bit more love and grace if we can see these stories. And that's why I love real people's stories. And I didn't know, when I came out here, the goal was to be a director in Hollywood, in movies, right? And, and this path is taking me in a different way, but I didn't realize that documentaries are so important to me because I have technically shot, I mean, so many 90 minute documentaries at this point, right? Of just two people sitting down and talking in, in all these interviews. Um, so it, it's, it's really important to me that whatever story is told, that it's coming from a place of love and growth and connection to make people feel less alone in the world. 
if, if I can really relate to Chris and, and his story and okay, he's making me feel like when I go through this pain, <laughs> I'm not the only one who ever went through this. Right? right. And so I can get through it because he got through it. Eric got through it. So that's the purpose behind the story. I don't think there's one story. I think there's 7 billion people on the planet. And if I can tell 7 billion stories, <laughs> awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I, that, I, if I can, if I, if I can do that, that would be amazing. Yeah, no, I love that. And I'm, I'm big on that too. And this is a, another thing too, like what, why first, when, when Chris and I, we lost our father when we were 18 years old. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's been a long journey battling with that. And, um, you know, I, at first, you know, like with social media and stuff, I, I didn't really understand the power of vulnerability and, you know, showing the courage and talking about the loss, like how I felt, how it um, affected my mom, just everybody. But Right. As I got more comfortable from just like learning from mentors to share those stories, I kid you not, Tiffany, like so many people just would always reach out and just be like, thank you, you know, just a, th a genuine thank you for sharing that story because they were going through, you know, losses and, and tragedies right. like that too. And it's just, that's what it's all about, you know, just up uplifting people and just like really turning your messes into your messages. I, I, I believe that. And I also believe you, everything is timing. Because I agree with you, as I've shared and opened up a little bit more lately, it's been great to get the messages, but yeah. also it's hard sometimes. I think some of us confuse vulnerability with um, therapy, right? You had to heal a little bit through that journey before yeah. you felt ready to share it because you had a lesson to share with it, right? Not just the story, but the lessons you've learned as a person. You both have learned, you know, through that. And I can't relate to that. I know my dad, his, my grandpa died when my dad was six. And so I've seen how that's affected him as a man, but I know that that's why he's so committed to our family, right? And it makes yeah. me tear up thinking about it, but he'll, he'll always be there because he didn't have that. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I just think, you know, we can protect ourselves too. I think it's very, it's very nice to share these stories and also heal from it first so that yes. when you share, there is a lesson people can grow and you can grow and you're not putting yourself in such a vulnerable position that if someone doesn't take it well, right, that now you're opening yourself up to a wound that hasn't healed yet. Yeah. I don't know if you'll ever heal necessarily, but you understand what I mean? Just, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. yeah that's, it's, that's a very good point. Yeah, and that kind of brings me to my next question, just, um, you know, talking about, like, open <laughs> wounds and sharing it and being more vulnerable. You know, like, what's the biggest insecurity right now at the moment that you face? Oh, that's a very good question I have not thought about yet. Man, I was like, man, I've been trying to think about every question anyone could ever ask me. Uh, <laughs> my biggest insecurity right now, truthfully, is this, is podcasting and talking about myself because I've been behind the camera so long that, you know, I've listened back to every interview I've done so far <laughs> because I want to see how I can get better and I want to shorten my sentences and get to the point. Don't say four examples, say one, you know. So my biggest insecurity right now is, this is using my voice is hearing myself back and sharing my stories in a constructive way and coming from a place of I instead of you should like I don't want to tell people what they shouldn't shouldn't do like I said there's seven billion stories my my truth won't be your truth but I think we can guide each other a little bit more like I said make each other feel less lonely but I don't really love telling people you should do this or this is right or this is wrong. So my, this is my biggest insecurity right now is sharing and telling my story and um, what, what people are going to experience after hearing this. Yeah. Well, I can, I can already tell like just like this, this whole discussion is going to move a lot of people. So you're doing great. You're only going to get better. Thank you. Oh, yeah. I'm oh, on yeah. it. I receive it. I receive it. Thank you. <laughs> Heck yeah. So let's say Tiffany, you had like a 18 to 20 year old just, entrepreneur just just mm. fresh millennial that just didn't know anything just was hungry and you had to take this person under your wing and let's say they they're they're they were aspiring you know video uh producer maybe director something with film like what was what would be the best piece of advice you can give them just to get started with communicate um a big reason why i had that issue when i was 26 is I was overworking, but I was thinking that I should be able to handle it. And I didn't tell people that I was hurting, that I wasn't sleeping, that I was gaining weight, that I was really truthfully felt like I was dying, like my body was giving away. And at 26, you feel like you're unstoppable. So I'm, I can't imagine <laughs> at 18, you know, you're feeling like you're unstoppable. Yeah. No one can, you know, I don't need to sleep. I don't need to eat right. Like I can live off of McDonald's and be fine. Um, and so I, the biggest advice I would tell them is communicate. Even when you feel like you might be saying it wrong, you don't have the right words, communication with what you're doing, with how you're feeling about things, is going to be your number one tool. 
to be able to create better, to be able to get these things out, right? Because we communicate through our stories. We communicate through through many different ways, but not holding it all in and feeling like you have to take on the world by yourself. I would not recommend that <laughs> at yeah. all. It's powerful. And, and what would you say, like, you know, shifted your mindset to start communicating and be like, look, I can't sit here and keep living off for four or five hours. I have to put my health at the forefront. I have to take care of myself. Yeah, I think, you know, the experience that we shared together, MITT, you know, going through some of those emotional intelligence classes, it, it's so interesting because I thought that I was creating myself, right? I, lo I love that quote. Life is about finding yourself. It's about creating yourself, right? I thought I was going out there and finding the things in the world that would make me stronger. And through that emotional intelligence workshop that we did, I realized that I'm just peeling back the layers of stone mm -hmm. that I had built up to protect myself yeah. <laughs> from everyone, right? I wasn't communicating because I thought people would let me down. I don't, I didn't trust people. And even though I'm a nice person, right? I'll, I'll, I, I was, I wasn't rude to people, but I always thought, you know, people would even slow me down. I remember when I first moved here, my cousin would invite me out all the time, come hang with her friends, all that stuff. And I just... I just felt like if I go and hang and relax for two seconds, you know, with you people, you're going to slow me down. I've got to get, you know, I just got to keep moving. I got to keep moving. So going through those classes, it was like, wow, what, what was Tiff like when she was seven years old? You know, when she, when the world didn't tell her, you, when the world didn't hurt her, right? Mm -hmm. When people didn't say those things to, to me and, and all throughout my life or when we didn't move so much. I remember, I was thinking about this on my run this morning. Um, my 13th birthday, my younger brother is one day young. He's one, he's three years younger than me, but we're, we have one day apart on our birthday. So okay. some you guys celebrate your birthdays together, obviously <laughs> twins. Um, we call ourselves twins three years apart. We celebrate our birthday every year together. And uh, I remember we were in New York, Long Island. We have most of our family on the East Coast. So a lot of family came. My dad invited all his colleagues from work. My younger brother invited every kid in his class. And I had no one to invite. And I was there by myself. And I remember my grandmother's funny. She's 95 now. She loves making fun of me in the nicest way. She's like, I remember, Tiff, you were such a loner. We, everyone was there and you were by yourself. I was like, thanks, grandma. Just keep reminding me of all that pain. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I just, I just had these walls built up. So going through some of those classes and reading the books and being in front of all these people, Lewis has made billionaires cry. Right. Like when he gets down to their relationships and their challenges and, and what hurts them the most and through the pain, I've seen people who have more money than I could count ever seen in my life still be hurt, yep. still be in that pain. And so it's a combination of a lot of things, but allowing myself to not keep looking for external factors to make to define me and really ripping back the, the, the guarded protection and layers and finding seven year old, eight year old Tiff who just can enjoy the world without expecting someone to hurt her. Yeah. That has been a really big part of my journey through the pain. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I appreciate you sharing that yeah, story. That's, that's definitely moving. Um, so this, since the podcast is called dynamic lifestyle podcast, um, we want to talk a little bit about your lifestyle. Um, so yeah. what, what is like a day in the life? Cause I know you said, you know, about 80% of the time, like you're not filming. So it's like, you know, tell us what is the morning like the midday? What's the wind down routine like? Yes. So finally, for a little over two years now, the morning is waking up around my alarm goes off at 430 right now in a month, November 1st. Uh, this might be out already, but it'll have to go off at 4 a.m. But the sun right now comes out up about like 645. So I am up stretching, changing trying to put my contacts in my eyes. If, if you wear contacts, you understand the struggle when you first wake up. Um, and I run. Uh, it could be right now I'm, I'm in a place of doing five miles and one mile, rotating that. Um, and then I will come home. Well, I'll do my Instagram short story. So to make sure everyone sees it and we talk about it and we build the community that way. Um, but I come home. I go jump into an ice tub for about 30 minutes, take a cold shower, drink a protein shake, and all of that should be done by 8 a.m., my full kind of morning routine and getting myself together. Now, which is very new, uh, just from 8 a.m., as long as I can, I might have a meeting at 9, I might have a meeting at 10, but I'm writing. This is the first time in my life, the last three weeks, I've been setting aside time to write and really understand that part of me, and it's weird. Because I know I have a writer inside of me, but because I haven't really doubled down on that skill or even I've just been hiding it for so long. It, that's another one of my insecurities to answer your other question. Um, and then typically it's meetings. So um, with clients and everything, we'll have team meetings or we'll have YouTube meetings or social media meetings. It might just be different dynamics of their businesses. And for right now, I'm also editing. 
because we're in quarantine and everything. So if I'm not filming, if this is like a, I'm at home all day, then I'll be editing probably some cooking videos for one client and then some clips for another client. I've been able to have a very large range of things that I've been able to film and cut. So it's usually that, and I'm working on my night routine. I did a live video with Dr. Trisha Smith, a good friend of mine, but someone who's worked with Lewis a lot and introduced me to the ice baths and everything and breathing techniques. When I ran my first marathon, she helped me figure out how to like change my perspective to change my breathing, like looking at the horizon and looking back. So many cool things she's told, taught me, but I'm working on looking at the sunset now at night, going outside and watching the sunset, dimming my lights. Um, I'm still not good at it, but turning off the phone and tablet an hour before bed. Um, and when it, yeah, that is tough. <laughs> and then when it comes to food, I will say this because I get a lot of DMs that I don't put my eating schedule on my um, my agenda and people don't think that I eat or something. But what I've, what I've always been trying to, well, not always, but what I've been trying to do lately is break um, patterns that I don't understand, right? So I don't know if when 12 o'clock hits, I'm hungry because I'm actually hungry or if I'm hungry because it's 12 o'clock, right? Mm -hmm. Because we're used to eating lunch at noon. Right. And so what I've, I've stopped scheduling my food. I know that I eat between 12 and 1 p.m. to 6 p.m. That's my range of eating solid, like, you know, a full meal. I'll have coffee. I'll have fruit or something in the morning. But for the most part, that solid meal. And uh, so when I am hungry, I eat. <laughs> <laughs> I don't eat at a certain time of day because I really want to be in tune with my body. That's something that running has really brought to me. I understand when I'm dehydrated now. I didn't understand that before. I understand when I've eaten something that my stomach doesn't agree with. So really breaking patterns is a big part of my day too, because it can be really boring being at home, uh, yeah, right. you know, going from shooting five to six interviews a week to, to zero or one every two weeks has kind of been interesting in the quarantine. So yeah, so I, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to pattern breaking, what can I do differently today? That's going to help me. So I, that's my kind of, I know I kind of went a little bit all over the place, but that's my day when I'm not filming, when I'm not in studio, when I'm not preparing to leave or anything, when I'm home, I'm pattern breaking. My agenda is on my Instagram so you guys can see it, but it's usually client meetings and emails in the middle of the day. That was another thing I changed. I don't answer emails in the morning. That okay, is the nice. worst thing ever. I don't. That's something I'm working on. <laughs> you guys have a different business than me, you know, but I, yeah. I, I took out a lot of my responsibilities where I would have to answer emails early in the morning. And now the way that I've set up my contracts, it's going to be okay <laughs> if I don't. Yeah. Because ultimately what that does is like that puts you in reactive mode. Like you're always like, oh man, like I see these emails, like I have to react and get to them and stuff. So absolutely. I mean, definitely something that, that took me a little time to, to do, but I mean, we're all a work in progress and that's the beauty of it is always like switching up your routines and testing different things out. Yeah. Your body is a test. And also it's, it's, it's reactive, but for me it was, I was putting work before myself. So that's why I don't, I don't even look at my phone. Now with the new iOS 14, I cleared all my apps off my screen and all I have is the weather app because I need to know okay. when the sun is going to come up. That is literally okay. the only thing <laughs> on my home screen of my phone right now. So I do bring my phone when I run because I have to, to do my beat the sun stories, but um, I don't see any notifications or anything on my home screen. And that's been nice for the last couple of days that iOS 14 has been out. Yeah, no, that's a good little hack right there. Now, I appreciate you sharing all that stuff. Tiffany, this has been an amazing uh, discussion. Like literally, we could just be going on and talking about different, different subjects. So I really appreciate all the, the knowledge, the wisdom that you provided. Um, before I ask the last question, I just want to just acknowledge you again. Thank you again for you know taking time out of your busy schedule. I know you're busy. You're doing so many amazing things. Um, just my respect for you, just again, from you leaving Florida to LA and just being perseverant, just, you know, relentless, everything to, to not sit there and quit is just amazing and truly remind me of myself. And, you know, I know you're going to have a lot of success going forward and I just wish you the best. Yeah. I just want to say, Tiffany, so I, I just, I've been talking to you the past like 30 minutes and I just see like, you're going to make a huge, huge dent oh, yeah. in the world. Like really you are. And I know this is like your only, like your first stop in your journey, but I see something huge that's going to just really inspire a lot of people. So thank you so much. Well, thank you both. And I'm going to accept the acknowledgement. I've been, I've been teaching people that a little bit this week. Don't just have to, if someone says, I love you, don't just say, I love you back. So I will accept your acknowledgement right. and let that sit in and receive it. Thank you both so, so much. You bet. Right on. You're very welcome. So last question is, what is your definition of living a dynamic lifestyle? 
my definition of living a dynamic lifestyle as of September 2020 um, <laughs> is to give everyone around you what you wish you had. And what I mean by that is my love language is words, words of affirmation. So everyone I love, I send them voice messages every week and just tell them how much I love them. Like how you guys just acknowledge me. You know, I think being a big cheerleader right now for the people around me is so fulfilling because I don't expect anything back. I don't expect a text message back, a voice message back. I just hope that they listen to it and that they feel how loved that they are in this world. So living a dynamic lifestyle to me is treating the world the way you want to be treated, giving all your love to your friends and loving yourself before you start to love the world during the day. I haven't said that in that way yeah. before. Yeah. I'm going to go with that. Woo, that's a mic drop. I was gonna say I was gonna drop that mic, but <laughs> maybe not. This one, this one. I yeah, <laughs> I, don't know, right? I love that though. Yeah, awesome, Tiffany. So, is there anything that um, we or the, the listeners can support you on, and where can we connect more with you? Yeah, I mean, this podcast that you guys have right now will be linked up on my website, uh, tiffpiler dot com. Really, right now, the the main driver is Instagram. Tip Tyler Film is my handle, and I have a few. Really cool things. I'm always taking meetings. I'm always, like I said, you guys, like what's keeping me up at night is all these ideas. And mm -hmm. so I've really been taking a step back to make sure I can execute it and answer a lot of questions that people have had for me and support with what I've done. Um, just to quickly, real quick, you know, I think uh, I've been getting this feedback. You know, when you think about DRock, me, uh, uh, there's a woman named Sarah Snow, who I love, who did a lot of Jay Shetty's work early on. There's so many people who are writing the book on what this looks like to be um, creating content for individual entrepreneurs and influencers. And uh, I've got a lot of questions on how to, how to do that if you're just starting out on different things. So I would say follow me on <laughs> Tip Tyler Phil uh, on Instagram because as these things start to roll out and I'm able to support people and answer their biggest questions, it will all be announced there. And like I said, my website, tifftyler.com. Awesome. We'll have that all linked up in the show notes. Guys, go follow Tiff Tyler. She's doing some awesome stuff. Tiffany, thank you so much for your time, your experience, your wisdom. Truly appreciate it. Hey, thank you so much for watching this video and another episode on pro tips on living a dynamic lifestyle. We truly appreciate it. Hopefully you got a lot of value out of it. If you're interested in getting more value like this from these pro tips, make sure to subscribe above. We're going to be dropping these daily. Also, if you are a fitness professional and you're looking to create more income, impact, influence, and independence, we just dropped our new book, Rise of the Fit Pros, so you guys can do all of that. And you can also start building your hybrid training model of in-person and online training. So make sure to click the link or the book right here to grab your guys's copy and we'll send it over to you. Other than that, we're out. Talk to you soon.